I want to start by uh, thanking the uh, organizer for inviting me. I'm very glad to be here. It's my second time in Brazil. Uh, maybe one uh, addition. I've been working at the Forintal Institute for a long time, but I moved to Eindhoven later, so that was my last affiliation. Um, I want to talk about uh, mathematics education for the future. Uh, let me give you a brief overview. Uh, I want to talk a little about the changes in the world around us, uh, where we have all kinds of phenomena like robotization, computerization, and globalization. And I think this will have effect on what mathematics you need in the 21st century. And uh, so I'll be talking about what we should be aiming for. And of course, I will say something about 21st century skills, but those are very general. I think we also have to look at the content, uh, content of mathematics education. And I will try to uh, f explore what changes are needed. And I'll use uh, three entrances. One is looking at the context where mathematics is used, so mathematics at the workplace. I will look at the competences you need when computers are doing all the mathematical operations. And then I will we'll look at a few uh, topics that become more important in the 21st uh, century. I will sp uh, speak uh, hardly about uh, what you have to know as a citizen, but I think that's very closely related to what you need for work. So I will be mainly talking about work and employability. And we know that robots are taking our jobs. I think there's something wrong with the translation. Okay, I'll just go on. Um, we don't have to take that uh, too literally. They're not little men, uh, uh, little robots. They are t taking our job, or still, they are implemented in all kinds of apparatus. Um, and the most important one is, I think, automated production. Uh, we know that from cars, but nowadays also in uh, building, we have all those uh, things that are ready-made uh, to be uh, used, all kinds of models, which changes the capabilities that people need. Um, as an example, I may uh, take my father-in-law. He was a radiotrician, and what he did for a job was repairing radios and television sets. Well, nowadays, that is not a job anymore. And that's not because there are some little robots doing this work, but it's because it's too expensive. It's very cheap to buy a new radio or a new television set. And that's the way I think our world is changing. Uh, new is cheaper than repairing. And it has holds for radios, computers, refrigerators. And in practice, we also use a lot of modules. Uh, so it's not, but it's not just production. Also the work of secretaries, bookkeeping, logistics, computer program, all those kinds of work are changing because of the work computers are doing now for us. And um, this goes together with globalization. And both inform uh, or support each other. And it leads to a change in the nature of the workforce. What was being asked from people? And it's already old research, but I'll show you these trends are still going on. So Levy and Murnane in 2004 found that there's more need for complex communication and expert thinking as a quality in workers and less need for routine skills, whether cognitive or manual. And they say uh, tasks that can be uh, captured in routines disappear. And what will be left it will be tasks that require flexibility, creativity, and lifelong learning. And of course, the ability to communicate with people. And they, they note that many jobs are already gone in manufacturing, clerical work, and programming, but also the work changes. I mentioned this before. And in addition to that, 
uh, factories need people who know how to work with computerized machines. So there's a new demand in what you have to know. And um, together with this, we have this globalization that is uh, indicated also by uh, Friedman by saying the world is flat, everything is moving around the world, and because of a lot of things are uh, uh, digital, that's very easy. And Goose and Manning found that there is a split in lousy jobs and lovely jobs. And the lovely jobs are the jobs that require flexibility, problem solving, uh, social skills, and so forth. And um, these are on the rise. At the same time, we see that the jobs in the middle are the jobs that are uh, disappearing because th these are the things computers and automated machines can do. And so uh, a greater part of the population now depends on work that uh, asks for very little uh, schooling, which of course has a negative effect on the income you can earn and the quality of work. So we have to try to avoid that too many people are uh, dependent on that kind of work. So we need education to improve the chances of our population. <coughs> so we can look in two ways at the role of computers and, and work. One is that of replacement. The computer takes your job, and that's happening. But also, on the other side, we have augmenting. The computer helps you to do your job. And then, of course, there's a need for complementary skills. And I think that's what we should be aiming for. And just recently, there was the book of uh, Brynjolfsson and McAfee, uh, The Second Machine Age, in which they show this, these things are going much faster than we were thinking. Uh, maybe some of you know Moore's Law, and he said, every two years, the number of transistors on a chip double, and the price is half. And you can see that in this graph, this is an exponential growth, so that is going very fast as we go further. But uh, the authors of the, uh, this book say, it's not just microprocessors, uh, also computer speed, energy efficiency, download speed, hard drive cost, efficiency, all these things are changing at the same speed. And so that is a combined uh, change that is going very fast. And on top of that, we are digitizing almost everything. Uh, we are miniaturizing everything, and uh, as a consequence, prices are drop dropping. So we can transform all kinds of information in ones and zeros, and then we can put it in the computer. Uh, what is text, sound, photos, video, everything can be translated and manipulated, which means that you can miniaturize and things get smaller, cheaper, and we can find all kinds of new combinations, which will be the new development for the coming area. And they gave an example of what it means. They uh, talk about Google's self-driving car, which contains 64 lasers, 64 sensors, in a unit that rotates 10 times per second. It generates 1.3 million data points, which are processed in real time to create a 3D image that extends in all directions for 100 meters. That wouldn't have been possible 10 years ago. They say in 2000, a similar system would have costed about $35 million. In 2013, it costed about $80,000, and it will be much cheaper now. So that's the change we are facing. And of course, uh, one of the uh, solutions that's put to the fore is that we should focus on 21st century skills. And I'll elaborate a little bit on that, but I, I, I guess there is some uh, acquaintance with this topic. Um, I like the book uh, of uh, Tony Wagner in which he describes a global achievement gap. And he says, even our best schools don't teach the new survival skills our children need in the 21st century. And that's American schools he's talking about. 
He did a little, lot of research, talking with all kinds of people in business, factories, and education. And he says, the expectations of CEOs are very different from what our schools offer. And he gives an example of one of those CEOs who says, first and foremost, I look for someone who asks good questions. And you can imagine that if things are changing all the time, then one thing you have to do is, is question what's happening. How can I adapt to those situations? And he argues that's not what schools are teaching. Uh, and learning to think, he says, is not a school goal. And he said we shouldn't blame schools for that, that it's not a school goal. We should blame ourselves or our society for this, because so society is not asking for schools to uh, learn students to think. And I think he's very uh, right on spot. If we really want to change education, we have to change the expectations of the society of what the ex uh, uh, schools can do or should do. The 21st century skills he describes are critical thinking and problem solving, collaboration, agility and adaptability, initiative, uh, effective communication, uh, analyzing information, and of course curiosity and imagination. And as a last point, ICT literacy. This, these are about the 21st skills that come to the fore in, in many uh, uh, programs on this issue. Um, if we look at this, those goals, we can uh, think of mathematics education where for a long time we have been looking at similar goals. We want to emphasize problem solving, critical thinking, working in groups, communicating. These are the things uh, we have been trying in mathematics education. Only we haven't been very successful up to now. Um, reform mathematics is trying to realize this, but um, creating mathematical classrooms which can be characterized as interactive and problem-centered is not easy. And uh, I think that's a warning also if we want to implement 21st century skills, that won't be easy either. So, and there is a few things we learned uh, the last three decades. Uh, there are a few points that we know now is important for changing mathematics education in this direction. We have to establish an inquiry classroom culture, and I will say a few things about that in a minute. Design instruction that enables students to construct mathematics and to cultivate student motivation. To uh, establish an inquiry classroom culture, we have to make a shift from a school math classroom uh, norms to inquiry-oriented norms. In school math, let's say the traditional school math classrooms, there is the obligation for students to adapt to the teacher's way of reasoning, to follow given procedures, not to trust your own reasoning, uh, look for the teacher, to the teacher for right answers. And that's a way of uh, um, acting that they have learned by experience, not because someone told them, but they learned by experience that's the wise thing to do in a traditional classroom. And if you then change to a classroom with other demands, then students are not following immediately because they are still working on the, under this, those expectations. And it's a big shift that we want from them. We want them to explain and justify their own solutions. We, have to, we want them to try to understand other students' reasoning, to ask questions if they don't understand, and challenge arguments if they don't agree with it. This is a different set of norms which uh, is not easily changed. In addition to that, we need uh, instructional activity and a curriculum that fits this way of learning. Uh, and an uh, interesting uh, means here is, is the idea of a hypothetical learning trajectory developed by Simon. And he described that as anticipating the mental activities of the students participating in the envisioned instructional activities. So before 
you think of starting an instructional activity with students, you try to think of how will they be thinking, because that's the important factor of what they might learn. And of course, you don't know for sure that's going to happen. So do you have to observe what they do when you enact this? You have to analyze what went on in your classroom, and you have to adopt or change uh, accordingly. And as a means of support, you should be able to fall back as a teacher to uh, local or domain-specific instruction theories that others have developed for you. And then within this framework, you try to think of how to adapt to your own students in your own classroom. In addition to that, students have to be motivated as well. Even if they know because of the norms what they're expected to do, they still have to be willing to do it. So you have to cultivate task mo motivation, which you can put against ego mo motivation. And you can cultivate task motivation by creating a classroom culture where students measure success by comparing their results with their own results earlier not with some external point of reference, but with themselves, like you would be doing if you were uh, an amateur m musician. Then you won't compare yourself with some high norms. You're looking if you're improving yourself, and that should be give you your fulfillment. Um, next to that, you have to cultivate mathematical interest. Students are to reflect on the mathematics involved, not just on the practical consequences or the good grades, but is this always true? Would it always work? Can I adapt it to improve it? Or would it work in another situation if I made some changes? Things like that. That's the way to expand mathematically. But uh, more imp uh, also imp very important, I think, is what mathematics should we aim for? Because I think that's changing also. And as I said, I will use uh, three entrances for this. I will look at the character of the mathematics at the workplace. Uh, I will look at the mathematical competencies that complement the work of computers, if you somehow uh, manage to work with them. And uh, the content, what's becoming more important because of the changes we are facing. If you look at the work parts, and, and there's a lot of research in the, the workplace, we see that uh, applied problems there have practical implications, often leaving room for several solutions and trade-offs, which is rather different from the closed and ready-made problems we meet in school. Um, the, for the often implicit, uh, uh, let me rephrase it, we have they use often implicit mathematics in idiosyncratic solutions. And say it's a little bit hidden, the mathematics, in the practices of the workplace. And um, that's different from the canonical uh, mathematics that is very academic, we know. And uh, Hoyles and Noss describe these as techno-mathematical literacies, which they describe as idiosyncratic forms of mathematics, they are shaped by the workplace practices, tasks, and tools in combination with the knowledge and contextual knowledge. So the tools you use, the, the things that are developed in the working environment where you're working, uh, sort of uh, frame the mathematics you're using, which makes it difficult for outsiders to recognize that uh, mathematics. And otherwise, on the other hand, people have to be able to adapt their mathematical knowledge to these kinds of situations. And these uh, techno-mathematical knowledge uh, changes over time because we change from manual tools and, and machines towards automated machines and embedded software and, and computer tools. So we need for a more global understanding of the hidden mathematics and be able to communicate about these mathematics with people who are uh, working with you or customers. The the second aspect I want to look at is competencies that are required in a digital society. And um, Levy and Menain, the, the ones I mentioned before earlier, say because of computerization, the use of abstract models now permeates many jobs and has turned many people into mathematics consumers. And 
be aware that there's a difference between doing mathematics and being a mathematics consumer. But still, you need to, need to know mathematics. Uh, when using spreadsheets or automatic cashiers, uh, automated production lines, uh, people who use this system are expected to make decisions on the basis of the output of the hidden calculations, of the hidden mathematics. So they have to understand the mathematics. And there's a nice quote by, uh, uh, I think Thomas Grandine said it. He's the head of the Boeing Applied Mathematics Group. There's about 60 mathematicians in Boeing company who are working together to uh, design and try out in, in simulation all kinds of uh, models of uh, airplanes. And he said, in school, the professor formulates the problem and you solve it. You hope. In industry, you formulate the problem and the solf software solves it. You hope. So it is a very different use of mathematics. And th that harks back to the two roles of uh, computers I uh, just mentioned. So the mathematics should focus on what computers can do better, not focus on what computers can do better, but focus on what is needed for working in a computer arts environment. Um, so we have to identify uh, what you have to be able to do mathematically in such a situation. And we are focusing on the competencies that complement what computers do. And it's interesting to look at Conrad Wolfram. Some of you may know of the Wolfram uh, group who make uh, Mathematica and all kinds of other uh, mathematics software. He says, if you think of doing mathematics, you could say, well, first step is looking where mathematics is applicable. Then translate a question or a problem into a mathematical problem. Solve that mathematical problem, translate the solution back, and evaluate the solution. That's mathematics in real life or in industry. This is what we do in schools. We only focus on number three solving the mathematical problem. And that's exactly what computers can do better. So we have to change to focus on the other three steps. So we have to focus on recognizing problems that can be solved mathematically, translating problems so that they can process by computers, understanding the mathematics that's involved, and being able to interpret and, e and evaluate the output. In short, competencies in the domain of applying and modeling, understanding and checking. And I'll work on, on these three topics. And I'll start with applying and modeling. So people have to be able to construct models and to uh, think about the relation between the reality and the model. And often these are, as we saw, ill-defined problems with varying conditions, trade-off costs, trade-off, cost and benefits, optimization. So there's a lot of flexibility you have to be able to deal with mathematically. And models have to connect mathematical concepts and procedures with applications. Often this is a problem in school mathematics. We, learn, we think mathematics is so general, you can apply it everywhere, but you have to understand the mathematics on such a matter that you, can, uh, such a that you can apply it. And often people know a lot of mathematics, at least when they leave school, but they find it very hard to apply it. And that's what Freudenthal called teaching mathematics as to be useful. Um, the, the next, uh, further on uh, applying and modeling is uh, competencies in, in uh, creating models, uh, structuring problems, Inter interpreting some problem situations, translating them into mathematical models, uh, and competencies concerning the results of modeling, interpreting the results, describing, explaining what you find. And often, we are will be confronted with the results of modeling activities of others, and make sense of that. So that is the, the modeling part. Um, but you also have to understand what's going on. I think to make informed decisions and to, to see what you're doing, workers have to understand the mathematics 
uh, underlying the work of comput or the computer, if only to communicate with others. And that's a form of conceptual understanding, which uh, harks back to a distinction Scamp made between relational understanding and instrumental understanding. And he described it as an example of calculating area. A student had missed a lesson and uh, uh, some other student filled him in and he said, well, I, I, I know how to calculate area, I understand it. But what he understood was what he had to do, multiply length and width. He didn't understand what area was. And I think that's the kind of understanding that we're aiming for. Um, and that is uh, um, also said by Caput, who he said it also in 1997, uh, more people will have to understand more mathematics, but more general. He called it sort of meta understanding. And he talks about democratizing access to the mathematics of change and variation. Uh, he, he says, uh, most people do not need to understand the things on a formal level. Uh, they have to understand the key underlying ideas. And he gives an example of calculus, ideas of rate of change, accumulation, connections between variable rates and accumulation, and approximation. These are the key ideas underlying calculus, and that these are more important than the formal uh, 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 calculus. Uh, are you kind of reasoning about formulas and so forth? Thank you. Um, and he argues, and I think he's right on that point, various sort of dynamic computer software might be designed and used to foster this kind of understanding. And if I have some time, I will show some of that. But this is also sort of said by Hoyles and others. Then the third point in terms of working in a computerized environment being able to check the output. And I have a very simple example to demonstrate that it's a different kind of mathematics than the mathematics we're teaching now. Uh, let's take a very simple arithmetical example. If you want to just uh, guess whether the output uh, that you see is about right, you might say, oh, it must be something more than 100 or less than 120, because the 4 times 30 is already 120. You could even uh, double 27 and then double the result and you get the price result. In doing so, you are using number relations. And often we use, uh, or at least it was very practical, to use uh, multiples of 25, 75, 125, and relating those to decimals, fractions, and percentages. And then shift the decimal point and things like that. If you have a, a powerful uh, or a good network uh, of number relations of this type, this is very powerful to check answers of just uh, plain calculations. You could reason that uh, four times 1.25 is five because four times 25 is 100, so four times 125 is 500. So I give some different examples how you could do that. And the more mathematical relations you have, the better you can do this. And you can also look at things in different ways and be sure that it's correct. So I think we should be working on networks of number relations. Uh, for instance, with uh, 25 as a key number, I already mentioned a, a few of those. Uh, and you could all think of number relations here involving 25 being able to, to split it in different ways of so three times eight, uh, four times six, and so forth, knowing the multiples. If you have this sort of uh, knowledge and you uh, combine it with uh, understanding of global arithmetic uh, properties like a commutative co property, associated property, and distributive property, you have a very powerful mathematical means of checking answers. And that is something you don't learn when you're working on algorithms for long division and so forth. So we re this really implies a change in the mathematics you teach. And I think that also holds for more uh, upper secondary uh, mathematics. All. So this entails different uh, kinds of mathematics. Um, as a third point I mentioned, increasingly 
relevant mathematical topics. Um, and uh, I go back to Hoyles and Noss, and they mention measurement, data collection, variables, covariation, reading and interpreting data, graphs and charts. And I think you, you see that it's very closely connected to the activity of modeling uh, in mathematics. And also Bradley uh, uh, mentioned these things, covariation functions. Uh, I think these are building blocks for medical and medical models. Um, and again, I think this is a shift from what we are teaching now. So the, the standard arithmetic, the standard procedures, procedures for calculating things, whether it's with, with uh, arithmetic or algebra or whatever, are less important than understanding those principles of uh, variation and variables. And of course, statistics is uh, becoming more important because those computers can crunch a lot of data. Uh, and this is important for uh, being able to, to handle all kinds of information and in this relation we speak of statistical literacy. Um, and of course we have space geometry with CAD CAM uh, and uh, 3D, 3D printing. We no need to understand more uh, space geometry. And uh, if you look at uh, pre, uh, 3D printing, this is going fast. This is a, a graph of how fast the number of applications in this area is uh, growing. And, and more and more things are done with three-dimensional printers nowadays. Um, I think, I, well, this is again... Uh, I think reiterating the importance of variables, covariation, and functions, uh, translating uh, phenomena in uh, numerical quantities. Well, well, computers only work with numbers. So everything we see, everything out there in the world has to be changed in numbers. So we have to understand how that works and what we lose when we do that. Um, so there has to be uh, a good understanding of the process of quantifying reality uh, a broad understanding of measuring that is involved, what involves uh, uncertainty, uh, repeated measurements and mean and measurement error, things like that. And of course, uh, data creation and data sampling, because a lot of the information that is in our information society is statistical information. So we have to understand the underlying principles of statistics to know what we are dealing with. Uh, but next to the, the, all these things that are, that are more focusing on the uh, goals after you leave school, we also, of course, have to be aware of continuing education and learning sense in school. Um, and we found that there are problems with Dutch mathematics education in the Netherlands. And we think one of the reasons is what we call task propensity the tendency to think of instruction in terms of individual tasks that have to be mastered by students. Um, and as a consequence, if you look at textbooks, you see that instructional sequences break off too early. When you find, or, or others or teachers find a procedure that works, they start training that procedure, uh, where uh, we think they should aim for more advanced conceptual mathematical goals. And I think this, this is something that you see on every level. And I take uh, multiplying fractions as an example. And uh, here I built on uh, research by Geke Brian Muerling on uh, fractions, but similar things are found in addition and subtraction up to 100 and in algebra. Uh, the textbooks aim at number-specific solution methods. And the, the origin is, is context-related. So uh, they, they started out with situations where you think of uh, repeated addition, which you de can describe as multiplication, or situations where you take part of something which you can translate of multiplication with fractions. So we have, for instance, uh, 16th, 
times three quarters, which is started out with 16 cartons of cream of three quarters of a liter. Then you get into repeated addition. You can imagine this as adding three quarter and three quarter and three quarter and so forth 16 times. Uh, but then if we take um, three quarter of, let's say, 16 pounds of something, then we first think of dividing it by four and then multiplying the results. So there's a very strange, so these are the things that are betrayed. 16 times three quarter is repeated addition. Three quarter times 16 is first dividing by four, four then multiplying by three. So we have a strange situation that you have a different procedure for 16 times 3 quarter and for 3 quarter times 16. And of course it works, but that is not what you're aiming for. And moreover, uh, so th these are number specific procedures and they are often tied to context. And then those students enter secondary education. And then they say, well, you know already, of course, about multiplication of fractions. That's just denominator times denominator divided by, sorry, nominator times nominator divided by denominator times denominator. And they show a picture where you can see how this multiplication works. Uh, and that is used as a kind of a proof. But um, we are reasoning on a very different level here. Here we are thinking about numbers, number relations, relations between the operation, multiplication, and division. And that's not what the students have been doing in primary school. So what they should have been doing is to generalize and formalize reason about why those two different calculations get the same answer. And um, that's at the moment lacking in Dutch schools and I think in many other schools as well. Um, so we can imagine a learning strand that tries to repair this. Of course, we start with fractions with identifiable units, like three quarter of a pizza, three quarter of a meter. Then we move into relational, rational, rational numbers uh, as objects where the numbers are tied to numbers. So three quarter is one quarter plus one quarter, or three, three times or one quarter, or one minus a quarter or a half and a quarter. When you think of it, then you think of three quarters in a different way. It has become a mathematical object. It's no longer tied to the pizzas. Um, and then you have to, on a higher level, uh, have to start to see the relations between operations like multiplication, uh, division, and fractions, proportion. That three quarter relates to four divided by three. Uh, that 16 times three quarter can be seen as 16 times 3 divided by 4, and so forth. So the, all those relations, and that's the level you are aiming, and then you can have a learning strand that is coherent from the beginning to the end. <coughs> um, I think I have a little bit of time to, to say a little no, uh, about uh, computer tools. Um, uh, computer Computers play a role in two ways. Computers change the goals of what we have to aim for in mathematics education. But also, we can use computers to reach those goals. And especially when we look at more general understanding of mathematical principles, we can dynamic software to help students understand those on a more qualitative level. And I want to show you some examples. This is what I just said. Um, here I have an example of a data analysis mini tool, and this is uh, developed to uh, do uh, data exploration and especially to develop the no notion of uh, distribution of data uh, as an object which you can reason with. So here you have a very simple representation of uh, a sample of measurements and each measure is represented with a length, which is a rather familiar way of representing data for students. And you can reason about them. You can uh, have other ways to represent them and, and compare them. And um, 
what you see is when you're working in this way, your focus is on the endpoints of those bars. This is where you can make your decisions on. So we could argue we don't need the bars. We could just focus on the endpoints. And then you get something like this. And here we would be comparing the speeds of cars and reasoning about them. And um, the, you can do that, for instance, by uh, using four equal groups, splitting the data in four. There are several tools available for the students to get a handle on this problem. And they can start reasoning about this. And they start reasoning about the shape of those forms and the density within the two bars. Uh, so you have a precursor for a dox plot and should sort of start to develop an idea, a notion of a distribution as something that has a shape, that has uh, a median, uh, that can be skewed or not, and where you can reason about. So this is a very informal approach to uh, data, uh, which I think you could start uh, in, in primary school. We, Paul Kopp and I worked with it in, in secondary school, and we have some re reports on that. Uh, Another example is uh, uh, a program available in the Netherlands called Algebra Arrows. And the idea is you split, you work with machines that can do some calculations. And you get a sense of what happens if you, you change these things if you, or if you combine them or if you uh, change the order, things like that. But of course, there's also this idea of input out, output. First is a calculation. The, the Arrows describe what you have to do to get the answer. But later, you, your focus is on how the uh, data in, in the one set relate to the other one. So you have um, paired data points that give you a function. And you can start reasoning uh, about the function, where the example here, you can see it's linear. And you could also have quadratic functions. And you can manipulate those functions. So then you get on a higher level. Um, this is what one example I like very much myself. It's uh, also made in the Netherlands. It's about a train driver, and it's a computer simulation, which I unfortunately can't show you at the moment. But the red dot is a train, and it's driving along the track, and the task is to get along the track as fast as possible, but without missing the stations. So you have to stop at every station. So the student can change the speed by the arrows that are in the right-hand corner below. And at the same time, there's a sort of photograph of the speed that is shown by this red bar. And the photographs are done, let's say, every second. So you can just see the history of how fast you were going in this graph here. It's a sort of rudimentary graph, of course. And then we did this in, in um, let's say, fifth grade students, fifth and sixth grade, and we asked them after this, well, we here you have two train rides, and you, you see those photographs of those speed uh, bars. And the question is, which train covered the most distance? And, well, students reasoned about it, of course, in terms of, uh, well, this one is longer, and that one is higher, and maybe it compensates. And, uh, but some fifth grade students suggested that you might stack the bars and that you could calculate the total length. And the train with the uh, biggest total bar length covered the longest distance. And this is, in a sense, the key to uh, calculus, to, to the integral of this function and how speed relates to distance. And this is very qualitative understanding of what we're doing in calculus. Uh, just another one, also on the calculus, um, which is about filling speed. How fast does the level of the water rise if you have a constant of speed of filling? And, well, you know, students don't realize that immediately, but once they see this happening, they say, well, of course, it has to go slower uh, because it's wider all the time, which, of course, is a very interesting and uh, observations. They understand what's going on. They can reason about this ph phenomenon on a very concrete level. And also, when they say it's going slower because the width is uh, expanding, 
they're talking about instantaneous speed, which is a very sophisticated concept. But they have an informal understanding of what that is. And when they have some experience with it, we ask them, well, we have two glasses. One is a, this cylindric long drink glass, and the other one is the cocktail glass. And we ask them, when is the speed with which the water rises the same in both glasses? And maybe I should give you just a brief moment to think about the answer to this question. The interesting thing is that the five grade students don't have a problem with this. They say, well, it must when be when the widths are the same. When the width is the same, then the speeds will be the same. But again, they're reasoning about instantaneous speed. And so they, have, they can pinpoint the speed in a, in a cocktail glass and they can compare it to the constant speed in a long drink glass. And that we use in a computer simulation to connect to graphs where they could think of the graph of the cocktail glass, the, the uh, black one, or the graph in an in, in imaginary uh, uh, cylinder glass, which would be a constant speed. And so they are working with the derivative in a very qualitative manner. Um, next to those tailor-made computer tools, of which I think we have to make much more and uh, develop them to, to uh, make uh, lots of mathematical concepts accessible. Uh, there are, of course, the ready-made computer tools that are available commercially and uh, in the form of calculators, spreadsheets, computer algebra systems, graphing tools, and so forth. And research shows that you can't just immediately use them. They need a process of instrumentation. Um, and uh, especially French researchers worked on this, and they talk about an instrumentation scheme, which consists of both a possible series of actions, but also, and that's important, a mental counterpart that consists of uh, mathematical objects, problem-solving strategies, and uh, motivation for machine action. So you have to understand the mathematics to be able to use those uh, computer tools. So they do the mathematics for you, but still you need to understand the mathematics at a certain level to be able to use it. So in conclusion, um, we have to work on, at least, that's my view, uh, 21st century skills that fit mathematics education. But we have to be aware that this requires a significant effort in teacher professionalization, curriculum design, and test design, because the current tests just are not tailored to uh, this kind of uh, education. Uh, we have to prepare students for mathematics in the workplace, that is, they have to be able to handle ill-structured uh, problems where uh, trade-offs, optimization, that kind of thing. Um, then we have to prepare them for those uh, techno-mathematical literacies. That means that they have to have a certain flexibility to work with the uh, mathematics they've learned. It's more or less similar to what, what Freund called teaching mathematics has to be useful. It has to be adaptable. It has to be be uh, uh, useful or whatever. Um, then uh, I, I spent a lot of time on mathematical competencies that complement the work of computers. This is in the area of applying and modeling in the first place. Conceptual understanding, so understand the key ideas. And I think uh, more people than now can understand more mathematics on the level of key ideas, if that's what we focus on, instead of the pr uh, procedures and form formal rules. Um, and that would be wise, given what the demands are of our society. Uh, I gave you an example of uh, checking the answers with global arithmetic, and I also showed to you that that means a different angle to what you teach in mathematics. And that is also, again, the case for more advanced mathematics. Then there are several topics that uh, become more and more relevant in our digital society. Variables, covariation, functions, data analysis, 3D geometry, and measuring. 
Um, and of course, we still have to think about continued education and long-term learning sense. And we have to be wary of the phenomena of task propensity, of teaching for individual abilities. And of course, there's a problem because we always test individual abilities in, instead of understanding. We have to aim at more advanced conceptual mathematical goals and that should also be the way we uh, formulate our curriculum goals. Um, of course, there's also the issue of uh, preparing for everyday life. I, I didn't really talk about it, but I think there's a strong overlap uh, between uh, work and everyday life if you think about the kind of mathematics, the kind of mathematical standing, understanding that's needed. Uh, one important aspect, I think, in everyday life is self-reliance and self-confidence when dealing with mathematics in everyday life. And what's also important is mathematics for active citizenship and critical thinking. And this is nicely elaborated in the ALL numeracy framework. Um, and then, of course, we shouldn't uh, um, be too pragmatic when also think of mathematics as a cultural inheritance. Thank you.